Have you ever had someone offer you something that they say is going to definitely help your life of faith and you've said to yourself, eh, I'm good. When you fly on an airplane, do you choose to leave your shoes on or do you take your shoes off? Both of these mysteries we will solve in this week's message. We're so glad you're here, not just to hear those two things, but how those two things might be uh, connected in our lives. Uh, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Owen. I'm one of the pastors here at Fuquay Verena, United Methodist Church, and we are glad you're here with us for this week's worship recap. We have crafted this time specifically so you can worship wherever you are, and we're super glad you are here. If you were not in worship with us this past Sunday, you missed a great chance to celebrate communion together. Um, so if that's something that is interesting to you, or if this is your first time or your first time in a long time, uh, you can text the number that's at the bottom of your screen and just let us know you're here and we'd be happy uh, either to get you communion and or uh, to help connect with you and get you connected with other folks. We'd love a chance uh, to do that. Also, uh, we're in a fall launch cycle, right? So we got lots of great things kicking off. We've extended the deadline for kids in praise for our kids. Core One is getting ready to kick off. We'll talk about that in the sermon in just a little bit. There's lots of great ways for you to connect. I'd encourage you to head over to the website where you can find information on all of that stuff. Uh, while you're there, two things. First, um, go ahead and RSVP for the vision celebration that's coming up on September the 17th. It's a Sunday afternoon from four until six. We got childcare. Uh, we'd love to have you there to hear about what God is calling us to do, where God is calling us to go, what God is calling us to be as a church. Should be a really exciting time to be together. Uh, and while you're there, if it's exciting for you, um, there's a give button in the top corner where you can help uh, make all of it possible and help others experience the same sort of worship that you're experiencing today. We look forward to uh, worshiping together with you as we dive into worship with this short song to set our hearts in the right sort of way.
Well, I think I've confessed to you before that I'm a person of contingency plans and all my contingency plans have backup plans just in case they don't work out. Uh, I love to kind of evaluate a situation and come up with all the options. That way, no matter what happens, I already know my plan. I'll have to stop and think about it. As a result of that, I have a policy, strict policy. Uh, on airplanes, I keep my shoes on because if the plane goes down, I don't want to cut my feet while trying to escape. Now, my father-in-law and my wife, they love to make fun of me and they get their chuckle on every time we get on a plane uh, together. But I just I had the opportunity to fly somewhere a few months ago. And when I was looking through the safety placard before we took off, I noted that the man trying to escape here has his shoes on. So I made my wife take a picture of it and then she circled it and sent it to her, her dad. I said to them, you laugh all you want, but you won't be laughing when I carry my shoeless family to freedom. So you make fun of me if you want. Mock away. I'm keeping my shoes on. Um, if you uh, have flown uh, recently or ever, um, there is this really interesting part of the whole safety demonstration that happens at the very beginning of every single flight where they tell you where the exits are and where the bathrooms are and where you can and can't go and all those sorts of things. And uh, one of the really interesting things that they say in every time is, you know, if we were to be in a situation where the cabin were to lose pressure, an oxygen mask will descend from the ceiling, give it a little tug, and then put your oxygen mask on and pull the strap over your head. And they always say, if you're traveling with someone that you care about, before you help them put their oxygen mask on, you've got to put your oxygen mask on first. Now, they have to say that every time because... Apparently, there is something hardwired in us to want to care for the people that we care about before we care for ourselves. And let's just take a moment to celebrate how beautiful that impulse is. I mean, that's awesome, right? So much is that our impulse that they have to say it every time we get on a plane just to help us remember it because we got to fight that urge. We got to fight that impulse. Um, secondarily, uh, it always feels selfish to me, but what they're saying is ultimately, if you want to help the person, if you want to care about the person that you care for, you've got to put your, if you want to help them breathe, you've got to be able to breathe as well. Um, I've been reflecting on that moment uh, of airplane rides uh, because last week we read a passage from Ezekiel uh, where on behalf of God, Ezekiel says, uh, a new heart I will give you, a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body your hard-hearted heart of stone. I will give you a, a fleshy, soft, beating heart. Uh, I will put within you, and I will put um, and I will put my spirit within you, so that you can live a good and rich and full life. This offer of God, right, to for the heart transplant. This offer of God to put God's spirit in us is not inconsistent with who God always is in Scripture. Uh, from the very beginning to the very end, God is regularly putting God's. In fact, the first thing that happens as humans, God gets down and breathes life, like animates our life, breathes life into us by breathing God's breath into our nostrils, right? Uh, the word for the spirit of God all throughout scripture uh, is words like wind and breath. And we believe uh, that the promises that we read in Ezekiel here were uh, made good on, on the day of Pentecost, when God sent God's Holy Spirit in a new sort of way, an iteration. Um, and we believe not just on the day of Pentecost, but to our present day, that God desires when the air gets knocked out of us to breathe life into us again. God invites us regularly to put on our oxygen mask, right? But there seems to me, like in all of my kind of pastoral experience over the many years that we've been doing this now, um, there seems to be an impulse that we need to name and remind ourselves to push through that prevents us from wanting to put our mask on first, right? So like God desires to give us this deep breath of the Holy Spirit to animate our lives, to, to restore our breath when it's been knocked out of us. Um, and uh, and we always like, we always want to turn and make sure that everybody else has what they need before we have what we need. That impulse exists in a spiritual sense as well. I, I don't really know what to call it. Um, and this is probably not the best way to do it. But for the sake of argument today, I'd like to call that the I'm good mentality. I'm good. It's like God is offering us this gift of breath and we're like, yeah, you know, I'm good. It's not a rude response or an angry response. It's not even a, a response that has a lack of uh, faith behind it. It's not opposed to the idea that God exists or to the notion that we should have a relationship with God and Jesus Christ. It's not even saying I don't have a relationship or I don't have a faith. It's just saying I've got what I got. I do what I do. I believe what I believe. You know, I worship how I worship. Yeah, 
I'm good. I'm good. But I believe that impulse is one that we need to press through, not just for our own good, but the but for the good of those we care about around us, right? Um, this I'm good mentality shows up in lots of different ways, and we could spend you know the next 40 minutes uh, talking about it, but we'll just spend the next 10 minutes talking about it together. So I, I'll go kind of quickly. I, I think uh, the first category of the I'm good mentality shows up really when we're talking about caring for other people. So I'll hear people say, you know, I'm good. I'm here for somebody else. Uh, I'm in church. I'm in worship. I'm here for those that I care about, but I'm I'm good. Um, and, uh, I, you know, again, I think that's a beautiful thing that uh, even if you don't really feel like you need to be here or you don't feel like this is something that's important to you or something that you need, uh, you know that you would still be here um, for those that you love, for your kids, for a spouse, for a friend, whoever it might be. Um, but, but again, I think I want to encourage us to press through that a little bit. I heard it said this way one time, uh, you can't lead someone else where you yourself are not willing to go. Um, and so while you might be here for someone else, you can't actually help them be here if you're not here yourself, like as your full self, right? Um, a couple of years ago in a church where I was working, there was a, a husband and a wife. Uh, they were a young couple. Um, she had a vital faith. He was there. He was good. He was there for her. And that was awesome. And I was super glad he was there for her. It was beautiful. They had a kid uh, together, uh, a son. And... Um, Mom said, you know, I really would like to have our child baptized. She wanted to own and claim all the promises that God makes without price for us at our birth. Um, and that was important to her. She believed it was important for her child. She wanted her child to have it. Uh, they had a conversation as a husband and wife together. And dad said, yeah, sure, why not? I'm good. Um, and in conversation about what we were doing in baptism and why, uh, he just kind of blurts out in the middle of that conversation, why would I want something for my son that I wouldn't want for myself? Great question. Tell me more. Um, and so we ended up putting a pause on the whole baptism thing because dad needed some space to go and process and to think, uh, to push through that I'm good mentality. And um, he came to a place where he said, you know, I, I don't fully understand what faith is or what it means, but I feel like it's something that I want to invest some time and energy in. Um, and when he came to a place that he felt like he could say yes uh, to as much as he understood about God and as much as he understood of himself, uh, he said, we're ready for the baptism now. And he said, and I'd like, I'd like to go first because you can't lead someone else where you yourself are not willing to go. And so he stood soaking wet, uh, dripping in the, you know, in the pool where we were baptizing people um, while we baptized this kid. And I just thought, you know, of all the beautiful moments in baptism that I've experienced or seen, that was absolutely one of my, uh, one of my favorites. Um, so I, I may encourage you uh, to consider pushing through that I'm good mentality for the good of everyone else, putting your oxygen mask on first. Um, I always think that that's best done in community. Uh, so if you're looking for a place to help you figure out how to press through it, uh, we got core one is getting ready to start up. Um, it's like a fresh starting point for everyone to figure out how to dig deeper into their discipleship uh, every day. And so I would encourage you to check that out if you've got questions uh, about that. Uh, the second I'm good mentality shows up when we say like, I'm good. You know, things just are what they are. They are what they are. Again, this is not in a rude way. Um, and, and it's, again, not to express that a person doesn't have some sort of a faith. It's just to say, you know, life is what life is. I live how I live. I do what I do. I kind of deal with things as they come up. Um, the French have an expression, fait accompli. Uh, we use the same expression in English. Uh, it means that something has been handed to us already decided. Um, whatever decision was made without our input, without our vote, any of that, it's just handed to us, fait accompli, an accomplished fact. And I think sometimes we live life as if life is an accomplished fact. Um, I was riding uh, on a road trip with my kids. They were listening to Matilda in the back. If you hadn't seen the remake of Matilda, I haven't either, but I've heard it twice. Uh, and in one of the songs, she basically says, um, if, like, she says, if someone is telling you that your story is already written and that the end of the story is what it is, fait accompli, um, you can change your story, but sometimes you have to be a little bit naughty, she says in a, really cute British accent. Um, and I don't know that Matilda is a great theologian. And I was also very concerned about why my kids were singing. You have to be a little naughty in the back. More to come on that, I'm sure, later in life. But um, it did occur to me that we we can change our story, that this is exactly what Jesus promises to do for us. Uh, the Apostle Paul um, writes a, a phrase in a letter to one of his churches. He actually writes a very similar phrase in two letters to two different churches. 
Uh, and it's a turning point in the plot. He's he's saying that this is the new thing that Jesus desires to do. He begins by saying, as many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Right. This goes in line with last week's passage where he says, if you're in Christ, there is a new creation. He says, if anyone is in Christ, if there is a new creation, then he says, individually and in a community, he says, there is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. And in the other passage, he adds, there is no longer barbarian and Scythian. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, what Paul has just done is he's taken the major divisions uh, in his day, in the society, in the Roman society where they existed. All these divisions by Rome existed to keep people in order and keep people in line. And if you could keep people divided up, then you could rule them well and they would maintain peace. Paul has just taken the whole system of how society works and obliterated it, right? He's just said that in Christ, these divisions, they don't exist. Can you imagine sitting in the room when you heard these words read for the first time? You've got um, slaves and uh, free people together. Um, Can you imagine being an enslaved person, hearing that they were equal with their owner? Can you imagine barbarian and Scythian would be like friend and enemy? Um, Jew and Gentile, insider and outsider? Uh, Male and female would have been a very hierarchical relationship as well. Like, can you imagine sitting um, on the, the, the low end of all those divisions and hearing for the first time, that your life was not fait accompli anymore? Like, this was an enormous change that Paul was proclaiming on behalf of Jesus. Like, This is what Jesus, Jesus does new things all the time. Jesus changes our stories midstream. I, I've said this before. When I came out of divinity school, seminary, uh, I thought that it was going to be my number one job to convict people of their sin, to tell people all the bad things they were doing and they needed to turn around and do something new. Come to find out in my 17 years of ministry, like convicting people of their sin is easy. People already know what parts of their life and the world around them is broken. What they need to hear is that it doesn't have to be that way. It's like we become lulled to sleep by this idea that things are the way they are and that if they are the way they are, then they will be the way they will be. They have to be the way they are, just the way it is. But Jesus says that's not true. That's not true. This is exactly why Jesus comes to offer his life for us, to offer his grace to us. It's, it's like if you are sick and you go to the doctor because you trust your doctor and your doctor prescribes you medicine and you trust that prescription. So on your way home, you stop at the pharmacy and you pick it up and then you take it home and you set it on the counter and you never take the medicine. It wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't make any sense. If you trust your doctor, you trust that your doctor's got your best interest in mind. You trust that your doctor is prescribing you the thing that you need to heal you from what is making you sick. Why would you not take the medicine, right? I want to encourage us to press through that I'm good, things are just the way they need to be mentality. Um, And to recognize the great physician, which is what scripture calls Jesus, uh, can change, can change not just our story at the end, uh, but our story, uh, our story today. And then finally, uh, the last piece of the I'm good mentality uh, really comes, I think, when people are saying like, I'm good, you're crazy, or Y'all are crazy, but I don't want to be mean about it. So I'm going to just do my thing and I'm going to let you do yours. Um, you know, I'm good. Um, I, I hear this a lot when people struggle um, to access faith. Uh, and it's maybe not even that they're opposed to a life of faith or to a belief in God. Um, but it just comes with a lot of baggage. Sometimes that baggage is like they have trouble accessing their faith emotionally. They feel like that's not who I am. It's inconsistent with me. Sometimes it's like a skepticism. It's more of a mental leap that they don't feel like they can quite make. Uh, And then sometimes it comes what I call pasts and posts. Uh, Like we bring a lot of stuff, a lot of baggage from our past, our past church experience or our past life experience. And we feel like there's not a place for us in the midst of that. Um, Or we've seen somebody else's posts uh, on social media and we've said, well, if that's what Christianity is, I don't have anything to do with it. I get it. We come with a lot of baggage. If I can offer a word to any of you who are saying I'm fine for these reasons, I think I'd like to say this. First, don't fear doubt. Like, I don't think that doubt is the enemy of faith. I think doubt can be a beautiful thing in a healthy faith, right? Um, it's uh, It can be a way that we like process out the things that are hard for us and help us come to a, a deeper understanding of who of who God is. Just because faith doesn't come easy doesn't mean that what you're doing is not faithful, right? 
So like, don't fear doubt. Second, and closely in line, I would say access God the way it's most natural and instinctive for you to access God, and then work on the other things. I remember the first time I heard this phrase, uh, faith-seeking understanding. It was written by a guy named Anselm, but built off uh, in the Middle Ages, but it was built off of the theology and work of of Augustine uh, from the 5th century. The idea of faith-seeking understanding, Anselm said, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe, but rather I believe in order that I may understand, faith-seeking understanding. And um, like that line gave me such permission. I am not like by nature a super emotional person. I access God like brain first, right? Um, And this gave me permission to recognize that there was beauty and it was okay to access God the way I was accessing God. Right, um, but it wasn't a stopping point, but it was a starting point. And then I've spent the years after that uh, pressing into the more kind of emotional feelings aspects of my own faith. Uh, it's been hard; it's come through a lot of prayer, but it's been a beautiful addition uh, to my faith. But it's not that I'm finally arrived, right? It's faith I've had all along. It's just faith expressed in different ways. So um, I'd say, like, however you access God, start there, do that, and then you know you can work on the other parts and pieces as you go along. Uh, and then finally, like post and past. I mean, we've all got a past, right? We've all got experiences in church, some good, some bad. We've all got baggage that we bring from our life, our past life experiences. Uh, we've all read crazy people on the internet. Um, those things are real barriers for us. They're real hurdles for us to get over. I, I don't mean to diminish those at all. Uh, but I had to come to the understanding at some point in my life um, that the baggage that I brought could be useful in the kingdom of God. It could be redeemed and used to help other people find place in the family of God. That uh, my past, my story, my experiences, my perspectives on Christianity could help people come to understand, know, love, and trust God themselves. But that not everyone was going to find my experiences, my past, my perspective helpful. But that there was very likely someone else with a past or an experience or perspective that was going to help that person come to a life-giving relationship with God. And that that those things, like that's why the diversity of the body of Christ with all of our stories, with all of our perspectives is so important. Because this family full of crazy people who have all found a relationship with God through Jesus Christ together, like we exist together to help all the world's crazy people find their own ways, their own path. Um, and I think that all of our stories can help people get there, right? Um, and so, your past, your post, the post that you've read, your baggage, your story. Like, I think all of those are good and I think God can use them. And I think I'd just like to say to you, I don't think you're here uh, by accident listening to this. And so, you know, if that's you, um, I want to, I want to encourage you to press through the I'm, the I'm goodness, um, and to seek out a faith that's authentic and real and good and true to you and for you. Um, I'll, I'll end this, um, for all of you who have heard everything I've said and haven't shut me off yet, but you're still thinking to yourself, yeah, no, no, I mean, I get that for, for other people, but I, like, I really am actually, I'm good. It's like, it's cool. I'm good. Um, uh, let's press through that. Let's press deeper. Uh, a friend of mine, 41, just had a pacemaker installed last week. Terrifying. Terrifying. Um, I called him after he got home from the hospital. He's been in the hospital for three days, running all sorts of tests, trying to figure out what it is. They still don't know what it is, but they sent him home, um, with a defibrillator, right? With a pacemaker that will also shock his heart back into life. That's how close the call was. Um, I assume he was going to be worn out by the time he got home from all that. So I asked him, you know, with that soft voice, like, Hey man, how you feeling? And he said, I feel better than I have felt in months. He said, it's amazing how much better you feel when your heart is working correctly. (laughs) Do you know what he's been saying for the last few months? Well, something feels off, but you know, I'm good. I'm good. It wasn't fate accompli, it was 40 accompli. We just assume we become 40, everything starts going downhill. This must just be it for him, right? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. But his heart wasn't working correctly. He feels so much better. Like his life is so much richer and fuller now that his heart is beating like it should again. Ezekiel, on behalf of God, says, I want to take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I want to help you breathe again. I want to put my breath back in you when it's been knocked out. This is God's offer for us. When we say, I'm fine, we go on just living living a life that is not intended for us, that is not good for us, that is not all it could be. I want to invite you to press through that I'm goodness and, and go 
go as you press through it, discover what it looks like to put to put the, the mask of the Holy Spirit on and to breathe deeply. Once more, I want to invite you to show up uh, ready, uh, ready to be filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to be healed. And I want you to know uh, that we're really, really happy to walk alongside with you. Again, Core One is a great place to start. That's an easy entry point. Uh, but just know that we're always here. No matter where you are on your journey, uh, we're ready to help uh, your next leg of it, uh, even, even if you're good. Even if you're good. Blessings on you and your journey, wherever you find yourself. May I be like Mary, open to the movements of your heart. Blessed in the keeping of your promise, a faithful friend of God. May I love your presence, Jesus, more than any gift you've given me. Well, again, blessings on you as you head out into the places that you live, work, and play. Um, know that the Spirit of God goes with you wherever you're going, and know that we are here. Again, we are always here uh, to help you wherever you are in your journey, to help you push past that I'm good mentality, and to find a vital and life-giving faith on the other side of it. Uh, whether it's Core One or anything else we've got going on, uh, we would love a chance to journey with you. So don't hesitate to reach out. Again, you can text the number that's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'd love a chance to connect with you and get you connected with others who are on the journey as well. Uh, so come and hang out any old time. It's been good to be together. Go in peace. We'll see you all next weekend. Bye.